So it's 13.55, and that means in room A04, uh, thank you, um, we're going to talk about Go. Uh, and this talk is called Go plus microservices equals Go Kit. And there's a little gopher in a hex nut there. Um, that's the logo. I don't know why. Uh, my name's Peter. I, uh, it doesn't matter who I am. You can decide for yourself if I'm trustworthy or not at the end of the talk. But you can follow me. I'm, uh, that's my Twitter. OK, um, this talk is about, uh, so Cloud Native Con, right? What is a Cloud Native application? It's like all these things that has all these properties. And one of them, importantly, I guess, is that uh, it's kind of microservice oriented. So uh, this talk, in this talk, I want to convince you that Go is a good language to write your microservices in. And I think GoKit will help. And if you want to use it at the end of the talk, that's great. I support that. But ultimately, I'm, I'm not really pushing GoKit. It's just a means to express uh, a few ideas, um, which I think are helpful. So maybe it'll help. Maybe if it won't. Uh, if you don't end up using it, that's uh, no problem for me. I'm really more motivated to uh, get you all to consider Go for your business logic, I guess. OK, so on that note, like, what is Go? Uh, I'm curious, uh, have we all, uh, raise your hand if you like at least dabbled in Go a little bit, right? Okay. Uh, how many of you have like done serious like production work in Go? Okay. Yeah, still quite a few people. That's great. Um, so for the maybe very few of you who, who need a bit of an introduction to the language, like what it is, where it sits in like the language matrix, I thought I'd take a few minutes to kind of contextualize everything for us. Um, Go was created by three engineers who happened to be employed at Google. Um, the, the apocrypha is that it was designed to, to, to solve at a language level problems that the Google engineers were kind of uh, encountering. And this is, as far as I'm aware, the first recorded piece, well, recorded, maybe I guess I could have faked it, but I promise I didn't. Uh, the first recorded piece of information um, uh, detailing uh, the, the first ideas behind Go, uh, the language. And it is an email sort of meeting minutes dated 23 September 2007, which is a really long time ago, if you think about it, in, in this world, uh, from Robert Griesemer to uh, Rob Pike and Ken Thompson. And the subject is prog lang discussion. And I guess this is the first meeting when they decided to, to go over what would uh, some points that would eventually become the Go language. So uh, starting point C, fix some obvious flaws, remove crud, add a few missing features. And you can kind of find this on the internet in a few places. So you can kind of get a sense of where they were coming from. They like C, uh, but they felt that maybe it was uh, not up to the task of modern, uh, modern, modern problems. So some properties of Go, I mean, there's many of them. These are the ones that I find the most interesting. It is a statically typed language. It is a compiled language. And it, it, one of the key things is that it is the compiler should be very, very fast. And a lot of decisions were baked into uh, what the language is and what features it supports in order to support this very important property. So the build, test, run cycles are very quick in Go. Uh, it produces native binaries for a huge number of platforms. and um, uh, you can cross-compile them very easily. It's just setting an environment variable. So if you have Go installed on your Mac, you can produce PowerPC binaries. You can produce AMD64 Linux binaries, no problem. Uh, it is a garbage-collected language, which um, was decided very early to be an important uh, usability kind of handle. Um, this does mean that it's not totally suitable for a lot of the things that C is suitable for. But uh, on balance, the Go authors decide this is the right move for the current sort of epoch that we're in. Uh, it looks like C, basically. It's got a big standard library. It's sort of a Python-esque standard library for lots of um, uh, things you need to do in this modern world. And it has baked-in concurrency, which we'll explore a tiny bit. In my opinion, um, this is what sets Go apart from the current crop of languages. Uh, I think it's a breath of fresh air from what I would call like kitchen sink languages, which is like the languages that say, oh, there's a feature, that sounds good. There's another feature, that sounds good. And to me, like the canonical example of this is Scala. It is a language of every paradigm, uh, which I guess you, it's, it's nice to have that sometimes. But uh, for me, uh, I really struggle to get productive in it. Uh, Go has and is composed of um, simple sort of orthogonal features that um, when you stick them together, they don't have surprising results. And to me, the ultimate like counter example to, to this would be sort of the Node ecosystem, where there's lots of features that um, are kind of thought and developed in isolation. And when you sort of apply them together, well, we've all seen the um, Gary Berendt uh, Watt talk, right? When he's going through all the JavaScript uh, concatenation things and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Go is efficient by default. 
And this is a source of consternation for many, especially new Go programmers, that uh, the, the, there is typically one idiomatic way to accomplish a task. And um, that way sort of exposes all of the CPU cycles that are going to occur. Uh, when you go through that text. So, for example, there is only one way to do for loops. There's no map or filter. Uh, and so when you write idiomatic Go, it tends to be pretty efficient, like not quite C, but pretty close. And, uh, and to me, this stands in contrast to a lot of dynamic scripting languages like Python and Ruby, where to eke out performance, you have to do things non-idiomatically very often. Uh, Go has predictable runtime behavior, and this means that when you deploy a Go application, there's not a lot of knobs to turn that can change dramatically the way it performs. To me, this is standing in stark contrast to all the JVM languages, which require, uh, in my experience, like quite specialized knowledge to operate at scale. Uh, and finally, Go has a familiar heritage syntax and sort of basically an imperative programming paradigm, which is familiar to most of us, I guess. Um, there are things you can do. You can program it in a slightly functional way. You can program it in a kind of object-oriented way. But in general, it's like pretty straight line code. And um, that's a great draw. It makes it easy to learn, easy to spin up new developers on. And in that way, it sort of stands in contrast to uh, languages like Haskell and maybe Elixir to some degree. So when we talk about languages, we often like to use words like, oh, it's simple, right? Or it's uh, non-magical. What do we mean by these things? It turns out these, these words are kind of like weasel words, right? So when you say simple, um, and this is a quote I found on the Lobster's website one time. When you say simple, um, what it actually means is totally dependent on your context. And in Go, simple means, and I'll try to read this here, um, that operational interpretation of a program fragment is unique, straightforward, and never in question after you've read the, the code. So this means when you read a piece of Go code, you know exactly what the CPU is going to do to a, some order of approximation. Um, from this no-nonsense point of view, higher order functions are already suspicious. And fancy uh, concepts like closures, transducers, and Haskell's lenses and traversals are complete abominations. I wouldn't go quite that far, but I think this gets at Go's idea of simplicity. Similarly, I found another. Uh, 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 what do you call this thing, a post on uh, Hacker News about the idea of uh, no magic or magic-free language. And uh, the key quote here is that um, uh, a, a bit of code is magical when it's not sufficient to examine the tokens that the code is composed of uh, and go back to the static textual definitions of those tokens to understand what's going on. So if you look at a piece of code and you read all the things, that should be enough to figure out what that code is doing. And if that's not true, then your code is magical. So in Python-esque pseudocode, this stuff on the left is magic. If this code runs, if you can s dot where did this method come from, then like how did that happen, right? And in Python, you can do this, right? And in Ruby, you can do this. It's called like monkey patching. Not magic at all would be this way of kind of composing behaviors where class something is derived from superclass, right? And you can go to the definition of superclass. You can read through what it is. So Go is entirely non-magical by this definition. And like I, I spend so much time on this because I think this is uh, maybe more than anything the thing that sets Go apart from other languages. Like you, when you see Go code, you know what it's doing. And you don't have to like uh, worry too much about uh, things that other programmers might have done to subvert your understanding. And at least for me, I love this. I love it, I love it, I love it. OK. Um, another sort of design principle at, uh, of Go was captured in this talk by Rob Pike. Uh, it is a language that was designed to s in the service of software engineering. And um, this also gets at uh, this like industrial bent, right? It was created at a company that was trying to make money, uh, and that way sets it apart from Scala, from Haskell, this sort of thing. And also sets it sort of uh, apart from the programming language community, or programming language theory community. So you do see lots of articles on the internet like this. Um, why Go is not good, or three months of Go from a Haskeller's perspective, and they make very uh, negative conclusions. And I think that's understandable, because in a large way, Go is saying all these programming language theory things that um, have been developed and, and, and uh, reified over the last 10, 20, 30 years, that's fine. We can take some lessons from them. But we don't need to build on them so directly. And so you get classic reactions like this. In fact, there's an entire uh, Git repo of articles that uh, um, are critical of Go, and they, they've been like subdivided into uh, the topics that uh, the, the author has really disliked. And uh, it's called uh, Go is not good. Um, 
a curated list of articles complaining that Go isn't good enough. Uh, ironically, if you go to this repo, you see that the, the thing that produces the list is itself a Go program. So, <laughs> that's fine. Right. Uh, one final note about uh, Mindshare. So, uh, I guess Go is a young language. It's like seven or eight years old. Um, you can, these are just two sort of random articles I found. You can find lots of articles saying uh, Go is gaining Mindshare. There's lots of interest. There's lots of new developers. It's not at the Java level yet, but if you are kind of staffing up a project and you are considering Go, I think we're at the stage where you're going to be able to reliably find uh, Go developers or at a minimum train people. People are going to have heard of it. Uh, they're going to be interested potentially in, in learning it, and that's very easy. So uh, I just have this slide here to say Mindshare is there or like growing. Uh, and we already know that, right? Because we're cloud native people, we can look at our, our portfolio of projects and note that a little more than half of them are implemented in Go. Um, gRPC has, of course, Go bindings. Linkerd is like finagle for containers, so I guess it's like Scala, but maybe it maybe uh, it somehow qualifies. Uh, Fluentd is written in Ruby and C, if I'm not mistaken. M maybe it should have been written in Go. I don't know. Okay, so that's like uh, that's the Go side of things. Now let's turn our attention a little bit to um, microservices, part of the cloud native computing uh, breakfast, I guess. Uh, my story with microservices begins at SoundCloud. Uh, I won't go into the details about uh, all of the things we learned there, really. Um, suffice to say, we were one of the early adopters, I guess. We did microservices before. They, they were still called like SOA back then, and then slowly, in the first year of our transition, they became microservices. And, and us and I think Spotify and Netflix were some of the first people. Um, so we learned lots of lessons there. And the one lesson that I want to kind of distill everything down to is that um, microservices solve problems in your organization, but they cause technical problems. They solve some technical problems, but they create far, far more. So choosing to opt into a microservice architecture is something you should do only when you know you need to solve problems that are latent in your organization. And typically, this means you're big enough that, um, well, I'll get into some of them now. But this is like the, the key thing that we learned, I think. Um, so let me enumerate some of the problems that are solved. Um, for example, my team is too large to work effectively on a shared code base. And by this, I mean literally the mechanics of pushing commits, having uh, uh, merge conflicts, uh, being able to push code around without um, causing too many like frictional problems. Uh, microservices solve the problem of my team is blocked on another team to make progress towards some business goal. So if you often find yourself uh, saying, well, like uh, my part of the feature is done, but that team isn't done, and so like we have a standstill in terms of our business velocity, microservices can sort of uh, break this traction, right, and allow each team to kind of iterate independently as long as they maintain these like strict contracts with the rest of the organization. That's cool. Um, microservices can help solve the problem of communication overhead becoming gigantic. This is kind of like a follow-on from the previous point, where you can't do things until you can like fully understand what everyone else in the organization is doing. The strict contracts sort of give you a, an escape hatch for that. And this all boils down, I think, to the idea that product velocity gets stalled, and we need some way to get that back up again. In my opinion, this is what they solve. Now, what do they cause? Um, in order to have any of these lovely properties, we need to have well-defined uh, business domains. And in, in the domain-driven design uh, terminology, this is called the bounded context, right? So you need to have stable APIs. Each microservice needs to have a stable-ish API. Uh, so you need to understand what your business does before you can do that. If you're still in the experimentation phase, like I'm not really sure where all my business domains are going to uh, land, then microservices are going to present a whole lot of friction for you. Uh, you don't get shared databases anymore, right? So like microservices encapsulate their data storage. That's sort of one of their key properties, which means that if you need to start doing distributed transactions, you're, uh, you're in for a world of pain because those are really, really hard, like, like uh, PhD thesis hard. Um, and you don't want to do them, actually. You want to figure out another way to do it, eventual consistency, blah, blah, blah. That's also hard. Uh, testing becomes really hard, too. In fact, I, as far as I'm aware, it is a design error. It's, it's like categorically incorrect to try to integration test your entire microservice fleet. You can approach that asymptotically with really strong unit testing and like contract testing, and you can make an attempt at some kind of like burn-in test. But really what you want to do is optimize for MTTR, mean time to recovery, right? You have really good monitoring, you have really good rollback procedures, and you just kind of test and prod, right, with canaries or blue-green or whatever. So this is hard, and it's like a mind shift. 
and this and many other things require the sort of DevOps culture mind shift, culture shift, where devs need to deploy and operate their own work. And that means they need to get paged when their stuff goes down, which means they need to be on pager duty or whatever. And this is often uh, problematic for organizations. You have the problem of job scheduling, which Kubernetes helps with. If you're able to use Kubernetes, that's great. But if you aren't, then you have to kind of like approach it and realize what parts you need, what parts you don't. That takes time, that takes energy, that takes automation. Then you have the problem of addressability, that is service discovery. How does service A figure out about service B? This is an infrastructural concern. Then you have monitoring and instrumentation. This should really be much higher in the, in the list, actually, because this is critical. This is the first thing you should be worrying about. Uh, old tools like TLF or like Nagios and New Relic, they're just like completely uh, in, insufficient for this new world. Um, you start realizing, hey, we need to have better insight into the things we're deploying. Maybe we need something like distributed tracing, and you can go next door and learn all about it, learn all about it. but you'll find out quickly that that's really, really, really hard. Um, it's, it requires like complete uh, homogenous um, uh, implementation of, of a certain stack over your entire fleet, and uh, if you have sort of decoupled teams that are responsible for doing it, it's hard to get them all aligned, and uh, the infrastructure concerns are big, and blah, 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 lots of problems there. You have to worry about build pipeline, CI, CD, this becomes important. Security, oh, there's this thing called security, oops, yeah, I need to wire all that in once I have my first zero day or whatever. Um, okay, so anyway, there's like all these concerns, right? So a lot of people come from this monolithic mode where they have their monolith, right? Uh, their big Java app or whatever. And then, then all these things I, I talked about are kind of like little piecemeal solutions around it, right? When you go to the microservice model, you end up shrinking your, uh, your monolith, right, or chipping it away, and you create more of them. But all these like piecemeal concerns, they're, they're, still, um, they're still present. It's just that they no longer interact with a single deployable artifact. They interact with like multiple deployable artifacts. So the touch points, right? There's many, many more. There's like exponentially more. And so um, the, the, the point I want to raise is that all these concerns, be, like they become multiplicative. And you have to have not only like answers to all these purple boxes, you have to have structure, a way of like uh, 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 solving these problems in a, in a reliable, automated, structured, coherent way um, uh, across your entire fleet of, of, of business services. So uh, at SoundCloud, uh, the, the chief architect, I don't know, he's kind of a, a floater, is a guy named Sean Treadway there, and he gave a talk similar to this last year. And um, he did a, a survey, and he went through all of the services in the company and counted up the number of purple things that they would need to have answers for before they could be considered like production ready. So how many like ancillary concerns does a single service need to have answers for before it can be deployed? Does anybody have a guess what that number is? 100, 25, okay, it's somewhere between. Uh, he counted 40 things. And some of them are obvious, like what programming language is it written in and what programming paradigms does it utilize? Uh, what transport protocols does it talk on? Some of them are kind of the things that I mentioned here, like what, uh, um, how do you do secret management? How do you do alerting? How do you do logs? How do you do log rotation? What's the CI pipeline for it? Blah, blah, blah. Some of them are really subtle, like um, how do you, uh, how do you uh, register it in service discovery registry, in a humane registry, so when it fails, you know like which person to talk to? A lot of things. So this is the context that we're all in when we opt in to the cloud native stack, right? We're, want to do microservices because we understand that they can help our businesses achieve much better velocity, especially as those businesses grow. But we need help to structure this stuff so that we can answer all these questions in a, in a good way. And so that's where GoKit kind of enters into the picture. Um, initially, I wanted it to be a standard library for microservices, something like Finagle for Go. Have, has anyone heard of Finagle or like is kind of familiar with Finagle? It's like solving some of these problems. Uh, it's in Scala. Uh, the idea is to provide adapters, bindings, et cetera, to common infrastructure components uh, to solve many of these problems. It's important that it play nice in your existing kind of heterogeneous environment, that it, don't, that it doesn't have like strong opinions about you need to structure your, apps, uh, structure your infrastructure. And this way you need to use console, you need to use Kubernetes. Like you have your own like uh, uh, opinions about that in your org, you have your own history, your own competencies. I don't really wanna have opinions about that. I just wanna make it possible to write Go and have it slot in and, and work well. Um, so in the end, it's like just some way of providing structure to tame this beast that we've described of incidental complexity that comes with microservices. So those were the initial goals. Today, it's, it's mostly the same. 
it turns out uh, over time, the project's about two and a half or three years old now, um, we become even less opinionated about infrastructure than we anticipated and even more opinionated about application architecture than we anticipated. So that's really what I want to talk to uh, talk about today is how to structure Go applications, Go microservices to be able to solve these problems in, a, in like a coherent way. And I'm going to use GoKit to sort of demonstrate patterns, uh, but you can obviously use whatever you like. Uh, important non-goals of GoKit. Um, messaging patterns other than RPC, there's a whole class of microservice stuff that's so-called like streaming or event sourcing or event oriented. Um, those are cool and interesting, but it's not sort of what I'm focused on at the moment. Um, I, like I said, we don't require specific types of infrastructure to work properly. You can use whatever you want, um, and we'll try to provide adapters to as much as we possibly can. Uh, we don't act as an all-in service framework, so I say toolkit very particularly. Like we're not something you have to write your, you're not writing like a GoKit application, right? You're using bits of the GoKit to make your application easier to deploy and operate and run and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we don't intend to re-implement existing good solutions or libraries or anything. When things are lacking, we'll provide better solutions, but otherwise we'll just plug and play. If you are familiar with other toolkits, other frameworks, here's where we kind of land in the in the landscape. Uh, Micro is probably the other big Go uh, uh, microservice sort of framework. It's, in my opinion, uh, from where I stand, it's very opinionated. It's sort of all in. You have to buy into the micro ideology, and it's framework-ish for that reason. And so I stand apart from that. Uh, Finagle was sort of the original inspiration, but in the end, it's much lower level than GoKit. It's more concerned with like the mechanics of uh, pushing bytes over a wire and um, getting bytes back. And it's very concerned with um, retry strategies when things go down and that sort of thing. We, GoKit has all that stuff, but it's not focused on that. Um, it's vaguely similar to Spring Boot, except Spring Boot is very magical by our previous definitions and very, uh, it's its like own world, right? You become a Spring Boot developer. I hope no one ever says that they are a GoKit developer. I will have failed terribly. Um, uh, it's, it's also somehow similar to Tokyo, which is like this new Rust thing. Uh, but Tokyo, I think, is meant to be almost as close as possible to a finagle for Rust, and so it's also quite low level. And I really want to emphasize, I don't care if you use GoKit. I do care if you use Go. I, I'm really sold on the Go philosophy as a way of like being a happy programmer, and I want to, well, to be completely frank, I want to create more job opportunities for myself in the future and get as many companies as possible to buy into this. Uh, but no, I, like, it, it truly makes me happy as a programmer, and like, I want to sort of share that joy. That's really my motivation. Okay. So um, I, I said many times, Go is about application architecture. What do I mean by that? So let's build up a little dummy service. And let's demonstrate some of the things that I'm talking about. So let's say this is our service. And if you know Go, you know the interface. I've decided to model the service as an interface. And what I'm saying here is add service is something, some you know, box in a diagram that can sum two integers and return an integer. And it can concatenate two strings and return a string. So it's like the stupidest possible thing you could write. Uh, because it's a service, right, now we want to be able to return errors. Things can fail. OK, so that's the. That's what we're building, right? So that's the, that's the interface definition. Our naive first draft, we've started um, adder, A-D-D-R, the Uber for addition or something. And, and we need to like write our ad service and, and get that hot, hot VC cash. So um, here's our basic service. Uh, it's an implementation of the ad, in, ad service interface. We have our sum method, which is just adding the two numbers. And we have our concat method, and it's adding the two strings and you know not much to it. OK, so this is our, like, this is our like, core business logic. Nice, easy. Uh, so here's, here's, our, here's our red square, right? This is, this is our, our thing. But there's a lot of stuff that we have to now start sort of layering on top, right? And the first one is a transport. This is useless. It's just sitting in memory. We need to be able to talk to it. So how do we talk to it? Typically, we're going to do like a um, uh, JSON HTTP thing, right? So um, here's our basic service. One way to do it is to attach a serve HTTP uh, method onto the struct. So it becomes an HTTP handler. It can talk HTTP. So we're going to switch on the path. And let's say if it's the sum, we're going to uh, construct this uh, request object. We're going to try to deserialize from the body. You could also do URL parameters. Like, who, who knows, right? Let's just say we're doing it this way. Uh, you deserialize a JSON object from the body into that thing. It can fail, so maybe it'll fail. Uh, you use it to invoke the sum method on the type. OK, we're just calling into our business logic. Cool. And then you're going to serialize JSON back to the client. Straightforward enough, OK. Uh, the concat thing, it's going to be the same thing, different sort of types, but exactly the same code. Uh, 
Okay, and, and this is pretty like isolated, I guess. We have the business logic are, are these methods, and then the transport logic is this method, and like, okay, they kind of don't interact too much. That's pretty okay. Great. So uh, what's next? We got to talk about logging, right? Everything has to log, okay. So um, how do we do logging here? Well, I guess one way is you'd um, take this uh, decode block of code and we'd stick in some log statements. And of course, we want to log the errors. So whenever we encounter an error, we log the error. And then we log success, maybe, um, at the bottom there. Okay, cool. Basic information, right? Uh, we do the same thing maybe uh, at the actual application layer. So that was like in the transport. Now if we go down to the, to the business logic, we want to maybe log the results of our computation. So we log our sum, we log our concat, maybe, I don't know, some straw man. Okay, like let's say that solves the logging problem, okay? But oh, now we have to do metrics, of course, right? We have to monitor our thing, okay? So how do we do metrics? Well, let's say there are some metrics defined globally or, or, or somewhere, and, and like uh, in, the, in the error cases, we want to increment the error counter. In the success case, we increment the success counter. Maybe in the business logic, we need to um, uh, uh, put a histogram for how long it took, okay? We can drop that in. Uh, okay, we've solved metrics, um, but now it's time to do tracing, and then maybe now it's time to do safety mechanisms like circuit breaking and, and, and rate limiting, and now, now we need like audit logging because we're uh, not just like doing debug printf statements, we actually care about like transactional uh, uh, semantics at a, at a higher level, and then uh, there's like this concept of service discovery that needs to talk to something else, and uh, what's our deploy strategy? Maybe it needs to go to Kubernetes, and there's like all these things, right? Suddenly there's all these things, and we don't wanna like just do like little edits in the raw code, right, for every single thing here, because then we get the spiraling, un incoherent, like impossible to maintain monster of a service, right? And I think we've all written, like I've written more of these than I care to admit, right? So what we want is some kind of structure to allow us to solve all these problems without just like editing the code uh, for every single thing just randomly, right? So GoKit promotes the so-called onion model. What is the onion model? Basically, you take your core business logic as sort of the center of the onion. And then for every other concern, basically, you wrap that with um, what I call a middleware. It's also known as a decorator pattern. And in GoKit, we kind of chop it up into three distinct phases or layers of the onion. Uh, the innermost layer is the service layer. That's where all your business logic stuff lives. And that's where you're going to spend most of your time. The next layer up is what I call the endpoint layer. We'll talk about that. And then the final layer is uh, the transport layer. Where is it? Ah, I have to click, apparently. Okay, uh, this is very similar to other architectures that you might read in literature. Uh, there's this thing called the hexagonal architecture, um, where it's broadly the same model. They use different terms of art. Like in the core, it's like the core domain, and then there's like a domain and an application layer, and then they, uh, I think this is from like Java world, so of course the outermost layer is a framework layer. Um, and then it's like interaction points uh, to all the other services that you talk to, a database, a SQL server, a mail server, blah, blah, blah. It's also very similar to something uh, I like a bit more, which is the, the, the clean architecture. And it's the same basic idea. It's a bit more a Martin Fowlery domain-driven designy, where at the core you have your entities. This is like your, your core domain objects. And then as you extend out of the circle, you, uh, in, you have start solving different concerns. So around the core entities are your use cases. And here you might write some unit tests or something. And then you have controllers and gateways and presenters, which in turn interface with the web, with a UI layer, with a database, with uh, some device, right? And uh, in the clean architecture, the, the core rule is the dependency rule, which states that source code dependencies can only point inwards, which is key. That means in your core business domain, it's like pure logic, right? You have um, your integers that you're summing together, your users that are like being manipulated. Only as you extend out of the onion do you start introducing concepts like uh, um, HTTP or gRPC, right? And the core stuff has no idea about HTTP or gRPC. All they care about is the, the business domain, and that's important. That's key. So let's take our dumb little service and let's model it sort of a little bit as um, in, in this onion way and see where we get. So we're going to take our, our service interface and in Go, the way that we um, manage request scope life, uh, life cycles, um, the way we do RPC basically is to have every method take a context parameter as, as the first parameter. And that's just the way it works. I won't get into the details here, but so we'll, we'll update our service interface to have that. Then um, we'll take our basic service and we'll, uh, we'll extend it a bit. We'll make it a bit more interesting. We'll have the sum method maybe uh, fail in some cases. Uh, the concat method can also do the same. Okay, 
So now we have our, our core, uh, basically the same core service. Let's talk about how we can fold in this uh, fun stuff at the service layer, at the innermost layer. And I mentioned already the decorator, the middleware pattern. Let's talk about what uh, a middleware would look like. In Go, this is one way to express a middleware that is a function that takes a service, uh, does some extra stuff to it, and returns exactly the same service, or I should say an interface that you can use in the same way, but that has additional behavior kind of wired into it. So for example, a logging middleware might amend a service with a logger. And um, here's how you would construct it, right? And in the sum method of that logging middleware, it would eventually call the next uh, layer down. But in the meanwhile, it would log the things that it sees, right? So this is like about as simple as it gets. It's just doing one extra bit of work as the request traverses through the logging middleware down into the next layer down. OK, what about uh, instrumenting, right? So we could have an instrumenting middleware that didn't contain just a logger, but contained uh, metrics like counters or histograms. And you can construct it kind of in the same way. And in your sum method, as the request traverses through the instrumenting middleware, you can increment your counters depending on what the parameters say. And in this way, we can sort of create these isolated bits of kit, these isolated little objects that can do solve individual pieces of this purple puzzle um, without complexing our core business logic or uh, like one mega function that just does everything. So you can, uh, I've, I've showed you like logging and instrumenting, but you can do pretty much anything with this model, right? Anything that needs access to your uh, core business domain. Nice. Um, the point here is that we're gonna solve each of these problems independent of the others, like I've said, but also that we're going to optimize the way we build this, this, this service for maintenance. That is, for adding new concerns, it's very simple. You just create a new decorator and you wire it in. When you want to modify an existing one, you don't have to care that you might mess up the code that's doing something else because it's very single purpose. Like microservices itself, you can kind of keep all that code in your head. Hopefully it's a very short little file. And of course, this makes it very easy to remove concerns. You just delete the middleware and then hopefully that's, that's it. So that was the service layer. That's where all the business logic lives. I introduced this endpoint layer. What is that? Well, it turns out if we have an additional abstraction which abstracts over RPC, it turns out we can do a lot of fun, easy stuff there that you don't have to write that maybe GoKit can provide for you. So here's our endpoint abstraction. Uh, an endpoint or like concat add any function really is something that can be modeled as a uh, function that takes a request and returns a response, right? So in Go, we have to do it this way. It sucks. Talk to me later. I'll tell you all about it. Um, and then we have uh, wire in our context, right? Because that's how that works. And of course, this can fail. So we wire, an error and wire in an error in the return. And so this is what it looks like. Request and response. This is the actual definition in GoKit. Um, with this, we can write a so-called endpoint constructor that takes a service and constructs individual endpoints for all the methods. So here's one uh, that can creates a sum endpoint. You can imagine an, an, another one that uh, creates a concat endpoint. This requires these um, request uh, per method uh, request and response types. It's all kind of boilerplate that can be generated. What does this get us? This gets us the ability to define an endpoint middleware. What does that get us? Well, this allows us to wire in behavior that doesn't care about what's actually going through, what the actual like A and B values are, but maybe just cares about stuff that uh, is only uh, to do with the request itself. For example, uh, if you wanted to um, prevent outgoing requests from doing a thundering herd on some service that happens to be down, you could implement a circuit breaking middleware that detected errors and after a certain number of errors tripped the circuit and prevented more uh, requests from flowing. And this, for this behavior, you don't need to know what is actually in the request. You just need to see that a request is gone and it's success or fail, right? So we can provide this, and in fact, GoKit provides this with a number of different implementations. Similarly, we can do like a throttling or like a rate limiting middleware. And so there's a lot of value add stuff that, that can exist at this level that you don't have to write that we can provide for you. That's cool. What else does this get us? Well, because we now have a stable, consistent foundation of the RPC idiom, we have a foundation that can, we can build a lot of different transports on. And so here we get into what does a transport mean? A transport is a way your service talks to the world, and whether it's HTTP or gRPC or whatever, it always works in the same way. A request comes in, you have to decode it, you do some stuff, and then you encode a response back to the client. So GoKit can provide, um, using the endpoint as like the basic building block as a foundation, we can provide adapters, servers to all the different uh, transports. So we have an HTTP transport, 
here's what it looks like. Um, you give it an endpoint, you give it a way to decode a request, a way to encode a response, and these are just like things that operate on HTTP requests, right? And then some options if you wanna do some fun stuff. And here's what the serve HTTP method basically looks like. I just copied this out of the code. You're gonna decode the request if there's an error, okay. You're gonna invoke the endpoint and then you're gonna encode the response. And there's a few other things, but that's basically it. So that's cool. That's how you can turn an endpoint into an HTTP server. Similarly, gRPC, um, we have a gRPC transport and it looks exactly the same. I mean, the type definitions are different. Decoding a gRPC request is different than decoding an HTTP request, but fundamentally it does the same thing. And here's what serve gRPC looks like there. It's exactly the same workflow, just you know, different types. So this is cool. This is like maybe a model of a service that we've built. We have our, our core service. We've done logging and instrumenting middleware in the service domain. We've split out our two endpoints or our 10 endpoints. We've wrapped them with um, you know, different endpoint middlewares. And then at the end, we've uh, and then like exposed them on HTTP uh, individual, like little HTTP servers. And at the end, we've wrapped all the HTTP servers in sort of a box. And we can present that on a port, and that can be how you talk to our service, right? But observe what's cool about this. Like we've constructed the HTTP server around the endpoint, but like we can also pass the exact same endpoint to a gRPC server. And we can expose the exact same service, exact same business logic, exact same um, like safety checking, all the middlewares, all the decorators, all the way down on two um, ports running two different protocols at the same time, right? And, and this is like key for me because we wanna play nice in your existing environment. We wanna, um, GoKit wants to be very helpful for like so-called brownfield development, right? Where you have this old architecture and you wanna kinda go on the migration path to the cloud native future, but you need to do stuff like this for a while. And this sort of extends, this is an example um, of transport kind of like uh, adaptation, but we also have the same idiom uh, in, in the metrics package. So if you're currently using uh, StatsD, but you wanna go to Prometheus, you can use a, uh, a metrics abstraction that you can plug in a StatsD backend into it today. You use that abstraction all through the code, and then later you can add in a Prometheus um, backend. It can go to both, and then later when you shut down your StatsD infrastructure, you just delete the StatsD implementation. That's totally fine, and that's how a lot of things in GoKit work. In general, we embrace and extend Go's philosophy to be sort of simple and non-magical by these, by these uh, definitions that we had talked about before in service to software engineering at the large. And put another way, I want to optimize for maintainability above all else. So the life cycle of the service from birth to death, and hopefully all services die at some point. Um, how much time do you spend writing V1 of the service, right? Versus operating it. I think it's like about this long to about this long, right? Or like how much time do you spend writing code in general versus reading it? I'd like probably about this much, this much, right? So. Um, GoKit is very much keeping that in mind, as does Go, I think, optimizing for reading rather than writing. And so it's a bit verbose in some places, but I think it pays out in the end. So I have, I think, like three minutes left. Is that right? Something like that. So I want to just quickly go through and talk about how we integrate with the cloud native stack. Um, spoiler alert, it's all basically decorators. So um, first up, I still have three minutes. Yes. Okay, we're gonna do it. Prometheus is a metrics decorator. Uh, it works exactly like this. Uh, we use this metrics counter, I've already explained it to you, cool. Uh, open tracing, very hard to do if you're just getting started, but uh, re re return to this uh, model. What is the life cycle of a request? Well, it comes through, it traverses all of these uh, layers, right? It goes to your business logic. It may need to like go out, call some other service, right? Um, that'll come back and it'll traverse the business logic and then go back out to the original requester. I literally have two minutes, I'm so sorry. but on the schedule, it said 2.35. Oh, that's too bad. All right, well, too bad. Thank you very much. <laughs>